Carrie Science and Research. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. You are all muted, so we can't hear any comments or questions verbally. Please make sure to type questions into the questions box on the right-hand side of your screen. At the end of the presentation, we'll have a few minutes to answer questions. With that, I would like to go ahead and introduce Dr. Kim Cooch, CEO and founder of Oral Biotech and the Carry Free System. Dr. Cooch has been successfully practicing dentistry for 35 years. He is also the world's leading authority on ATP as it relates to Carrie's risk assessment. He has a lot of passion for what he does, and it's always great to hear him speak. So with that, Dr. Cooch, take it away. All right, hey, thank you, Janelle, and welcome everybody tonight. We've got a lot of people on, um, and I'm, I'm excited. This is my favorite topic, and so uh, I'm obviously excited to do that. Um, I normally give a, a Carrie's update when we look at the research. Typically, uh, in February every year, as I kind of wrap up the review, the literature from the year before. But I have to tell you, as I've been reviewing the literature this year, uh, when my team here said, you know, what do we want to do for a webinar in October? I said, you know, what, we really need to go through the science because it's it's just growing um, at such a rapid pace, and I thought it would be really fun. So, um, so I've got some really interesting things to share with you tonight. Um, you know, I've kind of been toying with the concept of, you know, I, you know, as a clinician, you know, you and I see patients that you look at them and go, you know, you could fix this if you wanted to. Like you, you have dental caries because you choose to. Like it's like a disease of choice, you know. And and um, I, it's very seductive to want to think that. I think a lot of us fall into that um, mindset of, you know, this is your fault. You know, the, for the patient, it's just strictly a matter of. You know, you have this disease because you choose not to do something about not having it. Um, and I think as we go through the scientific research tonight um, with you, I think you'll kind of see the, the, the fallacy in that kind of thinking. Um, obviously, behaviors do play a major role, but that may not be the whole picture and the whole part of the story. And so I think oftentimes we jump too quickly to conclusions about patients. And there's a couple of data points that I want to just start with tonight. Um, and this happened, this both have happened just in the last week. Uh, I was alerted to a paper that was published um, in the PLOS One Journal online where the uh, researchers concluded that the sole cause of dental caries is sugar in the diet. And <laughs> anytime you have such a complex multifactorial disease as dental caries and, you, and, and anybody concludes that there's only one thing responsible for the entire disease process, you know, I, it, it, that makes me a little crazy, but certainly sugar plays an important role here, but, it, but we know that it's not the sole cause of this. And the second data point, the CDC just reported to the ADA on Friday um, that the dental caries rate in our youngest age bracket, the zero to five year old kids, the number of them with severe early childhood caries has gone down in the last four year reporting period. Now that's a trend that has been double-digit increasing for the last 20 years. And so to see it peak and actually start to go down, um, I, you know, I want to say hooray. You know, hooray for all of us who are doing caries management and that have taken a, a leadership and been pushing this whole concept for the last, you know, 15 years or some of them longer. Um, I, I want to say, you know, pat yourself on the back because I think collectively we are starting to make a difference and it's finally starting to show up and I think in the, in the area where it's most critical and that's in our zero to five year old kids. The second data point that they released was that while the incidence of severe early childhood cases, the diagnosis of those cases is going down slightly, uh, the treatment of those children, the number of treatments uh, are going up. So that's another data point that I say hooray to. Um, you know, we're managing to provide better access to care so that we, you know, the disease is starting to go down a little bit and at the same time our availability for treatment is, is increasing. Uh, those are both metrics that, that uh, I've been waiting a long time to see. So I'm pretty excited to share that with you tonight. Um, what exactly is it the cause of, you know, of the trend? I don't know. And where, is it going to continue that way? I certainly hope so. But um, we certainly have a massive task in front of all of us with, uh, you know, the, uh, with the greater public out here in America and certainly the patients that we see in our practice. When we look at dental caries, uh, this is a survey that came out this last year. Um, 
Dental caries is number one worldwide. It's the number one disease of the 291 diseases, major diseases um, you know, that we track in, in humankind. Uh, we're number one. And we're basically number one in all countries, in all age brackets, in all countries. So this is the most common disease known to man. And um, you know, the burden of this disease, uh, you know, this is such a challenge for all of us. And the reason that it's number one is it's a challenging and very complex disease to, to diagnose and treat. So you know, there's a reason that it's number one. Um, and the second thing that I want to, to uh, share with you tonight is, I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, Dunedin uh, cohort study, but this was uh, in 1972 and 1973 in Dunedin, New Zealand, which is on the South Island. It's a small town. And most of the people that are born there kind of stay there. They don't really move away. So it was a great opportunity to start looking at a population, a cohort of about over 1,000 kids born in that year. And they've been following them their entire life. One of the things they're looking at is their dental health. They're looking at all of their health factors, but they're looking at, at dental as well. And now at age 38, this is the last time that they were examined, and this has just been published uh, this last year, uh, the thing that they found was that there wasn't a huge discrepancy, discrepancy so much in the, in the patient's um, caries risk as there was that if you were low risk at the start of your life, your remaining low risk, the caries rate has remained constant for the for each of those different stratifications. If you started out life as a high caries risk individual at age 38, you tended to still be high risk. So the takeaway from this is that this is the number one disease in the world, and they've been treated, you know, during these 38 years by traditional dentistry in Dunedin, and um, I can go into you know it's a kind of a long story on what dentistry looks like there. It's a um, covered by their, their health care system uh, for children up to the age of 18. And then after that, there's really no private insurance, and you're really on your own, and you have private pay uh, dental care in New Zealand. So in about half of the patients, half the population, you know, see the dentist twice a year, and about half the, half the patients don't. So it looks a lot like the United States in that regard. But when you sit and look at this, the takeaway here is that traditional dentistry has no effect, no impact on the rate of this disease in an individual. And so if we're going to solve the problem we've got with this disease being number one, we have to do something different. We have to think differently. We have to behave differently. And we have to work with our patients differently. So that, that, that's the takeaway for me out of that study. The caries rate has remained constant in those patients. And so, you know, when we look at, you know, the answer to that then is caries management. You know, if we're going to do something different, let's manage this disease from a medical standpoint. That's CAMBRA, caries management by risk assessment. The challenge is that it, that can kind of get overwhelming to clinicians. I mean, it can get very. This is a very complex disease. We're going to talk about all of those risk factors and kind of update those tonight for you. Um, and it can be very challenging for us and sometimes overwhelming. And so we throw up our hands and go, "Oh, it's too hard. I just don't know where to start. I don't know what to do." And one of the things that I've noticed in the last 14 years doing this in my own pra clinical practice, that typically I see patterns of this disease. And if you can just kind of begin to work on pattern recognition, is this a dietary issue? Or is this a salivary issue? You know, or you know, is this a bacterial issue this patient has? And typically when I see patients, it's either one or two things that are the primary driving force in the disease. And so rather than dig through one at a time through 50 or 60 different items, if I can just kind of quickly assess and get a feel for the the pattern I think they fit into and target that, it makes my job a lot easier. And it's a lot less confusing. So I published this paper in this last year in the Journal of Prosthetic Dentistry, and I've, you know, I've been teaching this for several years now. Think about the usual suspects for this disease. And we, you know, when we look at that, you know, when I was in school, um, you know, it was bacteria, it was mutant streptococci and lactobacillus. I'm going to present a couple papers tonight that certainly draws question as to what role mutant streptococci actually plays in this disease. Um, but when I looked at, uh, we did a study with five. Uh, a multi-site study with five different practices across the country, and we now have data points over like 12,000 patient data points in caries risk assessment forms. And what we found was that the patients that were had um, risk factors, 63%, the number one risk factor was a, a saliva issue, and primarily hyposalivation, uh, medication-induced xerostomia. Um, 
55 percent of the patients had dietary issues and typically when you see a patient with a diet problem they're either eating simply too much sugar in their diet or they're eating too frequently you know if we think about the step on curve every time you eat and the pH in your mouth drops if you continue to snack too frequently and your mouth never gets the opportunity to recover you know we're creating those prolonged periods of low pH um, which you know results in net mineral loss from the teeth and that's really the definition of dental caries today um, if they have a bacterial issue, there's one of two things that I typically see going on. They either have too much bacterial load, just plain and simple, too much plaque biofilm on their teeth, they don't have good oral hygiene, or they've got a very, what appears to be a very thin biofilm, but it's very aggressive and it's behaving badly. And so it's highly active. Um, so those are the two patterns that I see with bacteria. Um, genetics is, is uh, changing rapidly. And we're going to talk about that tonight. And that's not something that we can always put a finger on. But when you can't find any other risk factors, I think you can start to look for, does this fit some kind of pattern that we've seen um, in some of the studies that have been, have been looking at gene sites and their you know, influence on dental caries? At the end of the day, this is a disease of pH. Um, you have bacterially caused, uh, bacterial mediated, prolonged periods of low pH in the mouth that result in that mineral loss of the teeth and you have dental caries. So at the end of the day, this all comes back down to the pH and that's something that we always need to be aware of as we talk to our patients. You know, when we look at bacteria today, uh, over 54 bacteria have been identified as potential cariogenic bacteria. Um, the most recent one was Propionibacteria acidophacians by Diana Wolf's group in Germany. Um, that was last year she identified that. Um, but the thing that I think we're all starting to get in a, in a in growing awareness of is that really this is an ecological shift in the environment and we're seeing what we used to consider commensal good bacteria are joining the party, have the same adaptive mechanisms and are able to produce acid just like um, the previous, like mutant streptococci and lactobacillus and it's either they adapt or die and starting to change our thought process from this is a uh, pathogen specific disease to more of this is a biofilm um, environmental disease you know in the mouth. Diet, you know I, we talked about sugar, Americans eat 23 teaspoons of sugar a day, that's obscene. Uh, it's one of the reasons we have you know the heart disease and obesity and all the other problems that we've got in the United States. Uh, we're also number one at uh, high fructose corn syrup consumption in the world at 51 pounds per person per year in our food supply. And Mexico is number two, by the way, at 32 pounds. So we are off the charts in terms of high fructose corn syrup and, and the, the amount of sugar that we eat. And that's why Americans, why we look the way that we do and we struggle with our weight the way that we do and our blood pressure and our heart disease. And I mean, you go down the diabetes, you go down the list. Um, saliva is, this is a huge issue in the United States. Uh, we know that there are 4,000 medications now that cause hyposalivation as one of their primary side effects. 70% of Americans in all ages, across the board, all age brackets, take one prescription medication per day. More than 50% take two or more, and 20% take five or more. And I tell you, um, if you're at over the age of about 70 in my practice, it seems like almost every one of them take 15 or more. So it's kind of, uh, this is the challenge, and the mouths get drier and drier and you take that protective saliva and it raises the pH and it has all of those ingredients in it to, to help maintain the health of the teeth, you take that out of the equation and you got a recipe for disaster. And last but not least, when we talk about genetics, um, there have been a lot of studies in the last um, four years, 11 studies that um, have looked at different gene sites and tried to do association studies, does this, is there any gene, here we've got this group, this population, let's look and see what genes that are, they're high risk for dental caries, let's look and see if we can correlate or associate any particular gene, gene sites with the disease. Um, this was a, a patient I know you've probably seen of mine in the past, uh, but you know, this was a genome-wide association study. We have the computer power now to take a look at, you know, take a thousand patients and study a half a million uh, gene sites and, and, and run that overnight in a computer program and analyze it. So it's like we have the ability now just to really start to study this. And you're going to see more and more studies like this in the future. Uh, this was a patient that had back uh, decay only in her mandibular incisors. And that's a genetic pattern. Um, and it's Lysel 2. It's a bacteriolytic enzyme. Um, anyway, but, that, but that's in the research literature. We're going to talk about that a little bit tonight. So we talk about the current biofilm disease model for dental caries 
we know that it has multiple pathogens. Um, and, you know, I almost hesitate to use the word pathogen anymore because, you know, uh, it's really a biofilm disease. Um, and some of those bacteria playing a role, uh, you know, are just good, good players behaving badly. Um, we know that there are potential systemic effects. I'll share with you the latest couple of studies on that tonight. And then we know that there are hereditary components of it. You know, when you stop and stand back for a second, you know, that could be the same description for periodontal disease. Multiple pathogens, systemic effects, and hereditary components. I mean, we have identified those exact same um, attributes and um, characteristics in, in periodontal disease as dental caries. They're both biofilm diseases. Um, so it's like that they have all of those things in common shouldn't surprise us. This was a study that was published uh, in April of this year. And they, they looked at individuals. And what they found was that as they studied the biofilm in terms of biofilm formation and then how it behaved after the patients ate, what they found was that the biofilm was person-specific and that there were some biofilms that had you know, apparently no bad reaction after the patient you know, ate. There was food ingestion. So it's like, but we're looking at the fact that your biofilm may be unique to you. I've seen proposals in the past that said there are bacteria that exist in the universe only in your mouth. That is so unique there could be as many as, you know, 25,000 different bacteria, you know, oral bacteria that could exist in the human mouth. There may be some that only exist in your mouth. So um, I think that's taking it to the limit, but certainly your biofilm is like your fingerprint. And so it's specific to you as a person. Um, and some of that is the environment, it's your biological makeup, it's your behaviors, and all of that obviously have an in your diet, your home, you know, all those things have an influence on that. Uh, and we know that in this study, they started to look at healthy individuals and then patients that had, they were high risk for dental caries. Is there a difference between the, you know, the biofilm makeup between these two groups? And so they looked at 621 adults, there are 174 of them were high risk for dental caries, 447 were uh, members of the healthy cohort, and what they found was that there was a shift or that there was a change in the bacterial profile between healthy people and people that were high risk for dental caries. And when we dig down a step and start to look at those altered bacterial files, what we found was that in patients that were high risk for dental caries, they had reduced levels of Vianella, Parvulin atypica, Megaspira, Fusobacterium, Acromobacter, um, Leptotricia, these are garden variety, you know, commensal bacteria, and they've been reduced. And I would particularly bring your attention to the Vianella uh, bacterial species. Vianella is a bacteria that um, metabolizes lactic acid. So this is a bacteria as a member in the biofilm that actually breaks down the lactic acid and, you know, raises the pH in the process and drives, you know, remineralization and health within the biofilm, helps maintain um, a homeostasis around the pH. So the fact that they had reduced levels of those bacteria is significant. On the flip side, patients that had, you know, high risk for dental caries, caries active group, they had higher levels of solobacterium, then they had Streptococcus salivarius, which is primarily found on the tongue and soft tissues, Streptococcus parasanguinis 1 and 2, and sinensis. And um, so you look at that, okay, so they had higher levels of Streptococcus. Now, what's missing from that? You know, this question when I ask here, and what's missing from that group is mutant streptococci. You know, why is you know why does that not show up elevated in these patients? And that's not the first time we've seen studies like that. Um, so that whole paradigm that we have around mutant streptococci, of course, I've been telling you for years that you need to like wad it up and throw it away, because this is a lot more. This is not a disease of mutant streptococci. It's a lot more complex than that. In this study that was published again this year in March, they started to look at the pH gradient within a dentin lesion carious lesion. What they found was that while about 58% of the bacteria were found across the entire pH range, there were other groups that were very specific to the pH. And so when you dig down another step on this and where it gets interesting here is when we look at those bacteria, you know, bacteria associated with dental caries in, in dentin caries um, in this study was lactobacillus, you know, obviously, Prevotella, Apotobia, Mosinella, and um, Actinomyces. Actinomyces, again, we're not surprised by that. We expect that. What they found in this pH gradient was that very low pH levels within the, the, the dentin, in this carious lesion, basically all you had was lactobacillus species. 
And I've seen other studies that concluded um, that it was lactobacillus and, and candida albicans. But it's interesting because I did some research about 10, 12 years ago up at Oregon Health Sciences University, and we were looking at pH gradients in cultures and trying to figure out if we could start to create a metric with a with a, an acidic culture to start to measure, look for carriage strong, uh, carriagenic um, acid uric bacteria. And what we found was that at a pH of 4.7, all we had left in the culture in the medium was lactobacillus. It was like down to 4.7, we had you know, uh, a range of bacteria, we had diversity, but at 4.7 it was like somebody flipped the switch and all we had left was lactobacillus. So I found this study interesting because it reaffirmed, you know, what we discovered as we were studying this like 10, 12 years ago. Um, at neutral pH, you had uh, Streptococcus anginosus, uh, Alloprevotella there, but the anginosus is a, a very interesting player and again that's certainly one of um, the bacteria that is an early colonizer, uh, certainly one that we've always you know, felt was a, a commensal, healthy, desirable bacteria. But we also know that strep anginosis, um, you, you put it in an acidic environment for 30 minutes and it shifts and starts producing acid like everybody else. So it can be a good player that behaves badly. Um, and Steve Duff and I don't know if Dr. Duff and if you're on the, the, the webinar tonight, but Steve's a good friend of mine and we've We've been comparing notes and working together for the last 14 years on this whole concept. And Steve had sent this uh, uh, study to me last week and asked if I'd seen it. And actually, uh, some, Simone Soro, uh, a year ago, uh, published a very interesting paper and for the first time very eloquently described dental caries as a tissue-dependent disease. That as it moved from the surface of the enamel into the enamel, through the DEJ, into the dentin, and then into the deep dentin uh, lesions, that the bacterial makeup change because of the nature of the tissue that was being degraded. And it was a very interesting concept. And they followed that up um, this year with this paper basically looking at bacterial composition and carious lesions. And what they found again was that it was really tissue dependent and that it's clearly polymicrobial in or origin and this, I, I guess the surprising uh, conclusion was that mutant streptococci was only found in extremely low levels, like 0.02 percent of the entire makeup. And so it's like it, it's really time for us to to kind of let go of the mutant streptococci model. You know, I mean, that it just doesn't hold up to all of the other research in my mind. This is a study uh, where they looked at again, then looked at a checkerboard analysis, 300 species out of 292 plaque samples, and then started to look at how does this compare, how do their bacterial profiles and their saliva relate to diet, lifestyle factors, and socioeconomic status. And what they found was um, at the end of the study, parameters such as age, gender, alcohol consumption, body mass index, these are things that we've all looked at in relation to uh, carries risk. And diet, diet, had no statistical influence on the composition of the bacterial profile in the saliva. Now we're talking about the saliva, not necessarily the uh, biofilm profile that was on the teeth. But again, it's like they had no impact. However, differences in socioeconomic status were reflected by the bacterial profiles in the saliva. And you know, we know that the low socioeconomic group have been very high risk. There's a lot of disease in that um, socioeconomic um, stratus. So <clears throat> that's something that. Uh, and what they found was the primary bacteria that they found were strep and Bionella. And you know that's not a surprise either. I included this paper. This is about um, periodontal disease. But I thought it was interesting because we've had 13 for so many years. As long as I can remember, we've had 13 pathogens for periodontal disease. And in the last year, this paper was published and identified four new ones. So we now have 17 species uh, that are pathogenic and implicated in, in periodontal disease. So uh, you're going to continue to see that grow as well. It's a biofilm disease. We don't know who all the players are. And it may be that there are commensal bacteria there that shift to play a role in that disease, that redox, redox reaction, you know, subgingivally, you know, anaerobes as well. So um, I think that, you know, it just continues to support, you know, the whole biofilm model for both of these diseases. And I thought you might find that interesting. This one I wanted to share with you. This was published in July. This is a, uh, a study that looked at bacteria that were in the mouth 
present in the mouth in the patient and then looked at the bacteria that were found in the atherosclerotic plaques of the same patient. And what they found was in, in the study, most of the patients were edentulous, like 77%. And um, in the mouth, strep mutans, uh, Prevotel intermediate, Porphyromonas gingivalis, and Treponema denicola were detected in 100%, 92 15 and 30% of the oral samples. So strep mutans was detected in 100% of the samples, uh, Porphyromonas gingivalis in, in 15%, and Treponema 30, 30, basically 31%. Strep mutans was the most prevalent target of bacteria in the atherosclerotic plaques. It was detected in 100% of the samples. So it was found in 100% of the mouth and 100% of the atherosclerotic plaque samples, followed by Prevotel Intermedia. And the vascular samples were negative. There was no Porphyromonas gingivalis or Treponema denicola. So it, it certainly supports previous work that's come out of Japan, three studies that indicated that uh, sharp mutans was the number one bacteria uh, implicated in the bacterial endocarditis. It was the number one bacteria located in the atherosclerotic plaque in those open heart um, studies looking at the plaque and on the heart valve. Um, this study looked at the bacterial load and periodontal disease and chronic periodontal disease and then vascular disease. Again, did the same kind of study and what they found was it was a, they took uh, 30 patients that had uh, periodontal disease, they had 10 healthy controls, and then they did a checkerboard analysis of the bacteria they found. Patients that had um, chronic periodontitis uh, had a higher bacterial load and were more diverse uh, than, you know, in their vascular disease lesions than patients that didn't have chronic periodontitis. Um, and what they found was, again, they found that the number one bacteria were not periodontal pathogens, but rather that they were other oral, uh, primarily, again, streptococcal species and also uh, E. coli and enterococci. Uh, so it, the bacteria species that predominated the atherosclerotic plaque weren't necessarily periodontal pathogens, but they were other oral bacteria and also intestinal bacteria. So again, kind of supports the look. You know, the question is, um, you know, cardiovascular um, disease is a, is a yeah, that just systemic inflammatory response is that, uh, you know, connected and strongly associated is a cause effect with periodontal disease, or could it, you know, could it be other bacteria in other oral bacteria or intestinal bacteria? And I think certainly at this point in time, I'm not willing to say that periodontal disease is not involved, and I'm not willing to point the gun at you know, karyogenic bacteria, but I don't think you can ignore them. You can't leave them out of the conversation at this point in time. I think, you know, we looked for perinol pathogens and we found them there, but, but when we started looking to see what other bacteria were, were found in that atherosclerotic plaque, we found that actually the perinol pathogens were in very low numbers, but that there were other bacteria that were present in much higher numbers. And I think you're going to see this just, this whole concept continue to develop. And so, um, yeah, I, I think it's interesting. Anyway, so there are potential systemic effects from having, you know, being high risk and having a high bacterial load. Uh, maybe the periodontal pathogens open the door, and then these other bacteria have the opportunity to invade the, the blood vessels and, you know, and get there. So um, this is a review of, of genetics and dental caries, and this was a very well uh, written review. Looked at a lot of studies and what we know to date about genes and how they influence dental caries. And I would tell you that, when again, when you, uh, where this gets interesting, is there are now 27 total genes that we've identified that, that are known to be associated and appear to play a role in uh, increasing somebody's susceptibility to dental caries. And they're really in four major categories. The first one is the enamel formation type genes, AMLX, enamel, the enam gene, that which you know influences the development of enamelin. Um, we've got immune response genes. There's seven of those we've talked about in the past. Beta dependent one, uh, CD14. I talked about Lysel2 uh, earlier this evening. We've got salivary genes. Um, just two of them have been identified. Um, other genes are that we've talked about some of these in the past. Certainly the TAS2R38 or TAS1R2 um, and the, the sweet and bitterness genes. You know for taste, uh, the matrix metalloproteinase is number 13. There are I think two more. Uh, MMPs that have been implicated as well for a total of 27. I think what you're going to continue to see um, in the research, this is going to continue to develop. Uh, this story is, I think we're just starting the story. Um, they're going to be, 
uh, more and more genome-wide association studies as we go forward. I'm going to present just a few of those studies that have been published this year. Um, but again, it's, it supports all of that work. And I would tell you, as, as we have that thought of, well, this is a disease of choice, that may not be exactly true for every person. You know, certainly for the person that, 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 you know, living on Mountain Dew or the person that never brushes their teeth, you know, certainly lifestyle plays a huge role in this disease. But there may be people who are highly susceptible to this disease, and I know that you've seen them. And then you have patients that are highly resistant to this disease. You know, you take the 12, 13-year-old patient that has cakey white plaque on their teeth and doesn't even have white spot lesions. The, stuff, the, the biofilm is two millimeters thick, and they don't even have white spot lesions underneath that. And then you got the person who has spotless teeth, and it's all, you can almost watch their teeth dissolve. And so it's like, you know, there's more to this disease than just those, you know, simple seductive thoughts that we have. And it may not all be the patient's fault. I think that there will be a point in time where we'll be able to diagnose, um, you know, a person's genome and identify whether or not you carry these genes that put you at risk. I think we're going to see that in healthcare in the next 20 years um, in, in all aspects of all kinds of disease. So this one was a, a study that was published this year, and they looked at enamelin again, and they looked at single um, nucleotide polymorphism, single gene sites, to see whether or not um, there was anything related. And the one gene candidate they came up with was the enam gene, which is um, certainly influences the enamelin, you know, development and formation of enamel. Um, this study was done on 1,006 uh, 2- to 12-year-old kids. And again, they looked at primary teeth for pit and fissure and smooth surface caries lesions. And they did a genome-wide association study, primary teeth. We've done this on permanent teeth, but we haven't really done too many studies on, on children yet on primary teeth. And came up with you know the MPED2 gene and the AJAP1, which have been implicated before. But again, they support this also then for not just permanent teeth, but primary teeth as well. Uh, a further study of a little over 3,000 uh, children, again, um, age 2 to 12, and what they found was uh, the actin-2 gene as well. And again, this is previously, and this is actin-2 influence of the melogenesis. Um, and so again, we've got another genome-wide association study uh, in children looking at primary teeth, and you know the actin-2 gene is implicated as well. I thought this was a fairly interesting study. They looked at, this came out of Iran. Uh, they looked at a bunch of, uh, I think, three to five-year-old children. And what they found was one of the things that we know is that people that are high-risk kids particularly, high-risk for dental caries, have a higher oxidative stress going on in their mouth. And what they found was that the total antioxidant capacity levels and salivary total protein increase in children with uh, SECC compared to caries-free children. Now, the interesting thing was that the salivary um, uh, total antioxidant capacity showed a significant positive correlation and the DMFS in this group as well. So it may, you know, may represent actually the body responding to the disease and trying to increase the antioxidant capacity, you know, in the saliva. Might at some point in time become a biomarker. So if we look at the research year and review then, just, I and mean, there's a variety of topics here that I thought were relevant. Um, this was a study that was published in, in the results of the study I think are not surprising, and but it's something that I think that we need to all sit down and, and have a conversation about. They're asking, like, why the dental profession hasn't adopted caries management as a routine practice, a standard of practice. And based on the survey, the conclusions were that, number one, we didn't feel comfortable doing it because we didn't really know how to do it. And number two, we weren't doing it because we're not getting paid to do it. So, the, you know, the challenges we've got as a profession are we need to educate the profession so that we're comfortable and competent at sitting down with the patient and quickly, efficiently going through caries management, diagnosis and management with them. And number two, figure out a reimbursement schedule so that we get paid to, to be physicians of the mouth. So that was the conclusion of this. I, I, you know, I, I'm not surprised. Uh, it's basically, we'll be talking about this at the Western Camber Coalition meeting next Friday um, in, in San Francisco. So. Uh, this is going to be the main topic, you know, how can we, uh, how do we improve the adoption rate, how do we increase this, where are the responsibilities lie both professionally and financially to make this happen. This was a study that was published uh, this year and, and it was looking at 
um, comparing a clinician's ability to predict dental caries risk versus a researcher's ability to do that, and primarily in children. And it, it, it was done in South Australia, and it was a longitudinal study. And what they found was that, you know, as clinicians, we can take a high high risk caries child and make a diagnosis and, and be predictive in a clinical environment about as well as they can in a research environment. However, when it came to the low caries risk child, that's where kind of the wheels came off the train. We weren't very good at diagnosing and predicting whether this they may be low risk now, but will they be low risk two years from now or four years from now? One of the best indicators of future alveolar bone loss and periodontal disease is current alveolar bone loss. One of the best predictors of future lesions in the mouth is current lesions in the mouth. But when you don't have any lesions, we don't have anything pre to predict on, and it's not as predictive if you don't have lesions today to say that you're not going to have lesions tomorrow. However, we go back to the Dunedin study, and we know that if you're low risk, in general, your carry status doesn't change for the first half of your life. So, you know, we have some conflicting data, but I, I think the Dunedin cohort is, is a very well done study, and I think that we can, we can should be able to feel pretty comfortable depending on that. But these are good questions to ask, and, and it's, it's good to have challenging information. You know, that's uh, for us to sort through and try and make sense of. This is a study that was done on adults. It was a, uh, done in Australia as well. And what they looked at, they wanted to know, is there a discrepancy in uh, the level of dental incidence of dental caries uh, throughout life on the patient adults? And is there a discrepancy in availability or the, uh, the amount of treatment that's given and the type of treatment? And what they found was that there really wasn't that great of a discrepancy in terms between individuals between uh, their caries experience, but there was a huge discrepancy um, in, in the social gradients for dental caries on how the disease was treated over their lifetime. And so I, I think that's really an access to care issue. Um, and I'll leave it at that. So the discrepancy was more in the availability of care than it was in the incidence of the disease. This is uh, this was reported in JADA this last year in April, and one of the challenges that we've got, and I think that we're going to continue to have, it's going to grow as patients lose their dental insurance, um, and people that don't have dental insurance trying to find that access to care, you know, turn to the emergency room, and you know, when you look at the cost that burden the system by a patient visiting emergency room with a toothache uh, in pain. Um, this is the, you know, the cost turned out in this survey to be average about $760. So if you think about an emergency exam fee, uh, maybe a periapical x-ray uh, in your practice and you write a prescription, I don't know what that total is in your, in your practice, but I know it's significantly less than $760. Um, it represents about 1% of the total visits in emergency rooms and about 40% of those patients are uninsured which means 59.5% of those patients had dental insurance that went to the emergency room. So, you know, that's, that's an alarming trend, I think, for me, just looking at that. I thought this study was very interesting. I, I just had a, a, one of my, it's been a long time patient of mine, uh, just a, a sweetheart, but she's a dentalist, and she asked me um, yesterday, how many, how many, what percentage are your patients are, you know, don't have any teeth, that have full dentures like me? And I stopped and I said, you know, I just read a study that looked at the population in general. They did five cross-sectional studies from decades, from the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. And what they found is that it's going down about 2 to 3% per decade. So patients over the age of, of 50 that are edentulous, um, we're at about 12 million people in the last survey uh, who are edentulous in the United States. You know, when I started practicing 35 years ago, that was about 30% of the population. Now we're down to, you know, probably, uh, I don't know what that represents in that age bracket, but uh, significantly less, let's say 12 to 15%, 12 to and they're expecting that by the year 2050 that it will be half, half, half again yet re reduced. So, um, so you know, again, I think kudos to all of us in the dental profession. We've worked hard, you know, through all of our treatment and managing our patients to help them save their teeth, and, and I think it's reflective in this data, and, and I think that we should all be very proud of that. So there's continuing declining in edentulism. 
this was a study that I included. You know, certainly maternal oral bacterial levels predict early childhood caries development and their risk for oral infection. And you know, we know that we inherit. Again, this is well established in the, in the literature. This is one more paper, but we know that you know we as human beings, you know, get most of our bacteria, our biofilms, you know, begin within the two first two weeks of life, and primarily from our mother or and or our primary caregiver, but that's who we get most of our bacteria from. And you know, if you've got a, a mom that has a really healthy mouth, that's a really good thing for the child. And if you've got a mom that's got a really diseased mouth, that's a, a really a disadvantage for the for the child. You know, as soon as they hit the ground. So, um, and again, it, this was Feather, John Featherstone, um, Francisco Ramos in the study, um, and again looking at maternal mutant streptococci and lactobacillus. You know, that may bring up a. <clears throat> I get this question from time to time. I tell you that this is not a disease of mutant streptococci, and then I turn around and we talk about mutant streptococci, you know, and, and all of this research. And I would tell you that we have an abundant amount historically. We have 40 years of research that shows strong correlation between mutant streptococci levels and um, dental caries risk in children. Now, it doesn't extrapolate to adults, but with the, and we know that in children. Um, and we, I think, for a long time, we made a cause and effect kind of conclusion around that. It could be that mutant streptococci plays a, a role in initiating the disease process and that's if that's a limit or an extent of its role. It could be that it doesn't even play that ex extent of a role. I, I would tell you at this point in time I question and I don't really know. But a lot of our research still looks at mutant streptococci. We do have research that says it does correlate strongly. It could be that if we looked at other species present there, that they may be in high. It may just be a function of the overall bacterial load, and we're just taking a metric that tends to correlate. Um, so there, there are features, you know, or behaviors that mutant streptococci has that we've identified, but they're not unique to mutant streptococci. So, um, I would tell you, don't be confused by the fact that. Um, you know, I tell you, we question the role of, of its role in the disease, or certainly what we thought the role in the disease was. And then I, you know, we go back and then start quoting, well, there's strep mutans in the coronary arteries and, and you know, the atherosclerotic plaque, and you know, here we are studying that. Um, that may feel in conflict to you, but um, don't let it. Don't don't let that feel like a conflict. Just try to take the the, the research at face value. And, and try and see how it applies to what we know and, and continue to develop our, our understanding or our picture of this disease. This is a study that looked at oral arginine uh, metabolism. And the thing about arginine and the deaminase system in the mouth, arginine gets broken down and produces ammonia. One mole of arginine produces two moles of ammonia in the mouth. And that raises the pH in the biofilm, and it's one of the important mechanisms in the biofilm on the teeth, which allows us to maintain the, the pH or a healthy pH and drive remineralization. So um, one of the things that, you know, there have been a number of studies done on the arginine DMA system, and what they found was that the arginine levels didn't, wasn't different uh, between children in the saliva, between children that had that were high risk for dental caries and children that were healthy, but there were uh, significantly higher activity of the arginine deaminase system in the dental caries plaque um, in patients that were um, caries free. So, like the, you know, that drives the pH up in the patients that had a high, that were high risk or had caries activity. They had a reduced level of arginine deaminase activity in the biofilm on the teeth. When you looked at the, that activity or the amount of arginine present in the saliva, it was the same for both groups. This is a study I included. I thought it was very interesting. I've always had the concept that um, occlusal carious lesions were an anatomical issue. You know, there was a defect in how the occlusal fissure developed, and that made it highly susceptible. And as a result of that, uh, that's why you know some patients that had healthy and and, and sound pits and fissures didn't end up with as much dental caries than the ones that had you know these enamel defects. And I really saw it as an anatomical developmental issue. And this was a, a systematic review of the scientific literature published this year, and it categorically the, the research literature does not support that thought. And in fact, what it does support is that time of eruption, how long it takes for the tooth to erupt, correlates to the risk. And at the same 
point how long it takes before there is physiological contact and occlusion which naturally cleans the tooth so having that plaque or you know that buildup of um, biofilm you know the high bacterial load for prolonged periods of time is the risk not the defect or the uh, anatomy of the fissure itself so this kind of represented a new paradigm for me and so I thought I'd share that with you I'm sure that some of you have had the same paradigm that I've had and it's really more a function of delayed slow eruption of the teeth and then lack of mechanical function to help you know clean that biofilm off the teeth in those fissures and that's what the research shows when you look at a systematic review this study looked at examined and I thought this was interesting I have a cone beam in my practice I place implants and I'm sure that many of you also have cone beams or certainly if you place implants I know you're getting a cone beam for your patient and so you look at the cone beam and you know it's an exciting new technology it's pretty incredible you know when you play with when you use it um, the question is, how accurate is it compared to emulsion, high-speed emulsion film or digital sensors in looking for and accurately diagnosing or, or uh, identifying, let's say, um, non-cavitated occlusal lesions? And what they found is that statistically it's no better than emulsion film and it's no better than digital sensors. And the reality is they're all equally bad. They're all poor in terms of their diagnostic accuracy. So all of those films, I, you know, I thought, well, maybe this would be an opportunity for us to, you know, be more um, accurate in diagnosing those lesions. And the reality is not not so. So just wanted to share that with you. So don't uh, don't take home beam images to diagnose uh, non-cavitated um, occlusal lesions. Um, this was an interesting study and something that really wasn't on my radar screen. It wasn't something I'd really thought about until I read this study. And in the study what they said was that, you know, most of us now are tending to leave behind the affected dentin. We take the um, the lesion, the active lesion, and we take the infected dentin out, but we know that the best thing that we can do is leave the affected dentin and bond or, you know, place a glass ionomer, resin modified glass ionomer intermediate over that and then restore the tooth in one step. There's a lot of research I presented in the past that supports that idea. One of the challenges is if you do that, it's going to look radiolucent on a radiograph, and there's a you know your you know you know it's there, you know what it is, and you know that it's healthy. But the patient may go to another dentist, and they go to dentist B, and dentist B looks at it and says, "Oh, you've got recurrent, you've got a recurrent secondary lesion starting underneath this you know composite restoration that Dr. A placed for you. I need to replace that." <coughs> And what they did in this study, I never even considered that as a possibility, but it's an interesting idea. And I think, you know, for all of you who are, are using that same philosophy in, in restorative care, um, in this study, we may see a commercial product in the future at some point like this, but they used tin chloride salt with water. And what it did was it masked the radio, you know, the radiolucency so that it looked like sound dentin, so that somebody wouldn't re-restore something that we had done, you know, an incomplete excavation procedure on. I thought it was a very interesting uh, thought process there. So something I just really I hadn't thought about previously. So I thought I'd share that with you. This is a study. I mean, I know that we're all using fluoride varnish, and we know based on a, a number of, of previous studies that, um, particularly in children, that in the in the in the severe early childhood caries child, that the optimum um, dose of fluoride varnish frequency is four times a year that that's where it peaks in terms of outcome. And if you go more frequently than four times a year, there's no additional benefit. So we really have that calibrated to four times a year. <coughs> this was a study that looked at two times a year and said it doesn't work. For, for children who are already having fluoride water in their water and they were already using fluoride toothpaste, twice a year, um, twice a year fluoride varnish application didn't provide any additional benefit. Now, I think, you know, hear me clearly on this. This was the study of my healthy patients that I'm seeing in my practice, my children. Uh, I'm still doing fluoride varnishes on them twice a year. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that that, that is a, a, the risk, or I, I still think there's a benefit that outweighs the risk of not doing it. So um, this isn't uh, stop doing it. Um, this is just if you've got the high caries risk kid, you need to do it four times a year. Two, two times a year isn't really enough. It's not effective. That's my takeaway. 
You know, and we look at the level of fluoride that we're using in kids today, and I, you know, that's a concern. It's a concern for parents out there. I think we all, uh, yeah, you know, we're using a lot higher level of fluoride than we were using when I started 35 years ago. Um, and so this study looked at, well, is it having any impact in the bone, in the skeleton? And you can actually do fluoride skeletal scans. And so they did that on a, a bunch of patients and found that it has no significant impact whatsoever on the fluoride level in the bone. So what we're doing in dentistry is, is not having an impact on the skeleton. So I think that's, that's a relief. This is a, a study that I included because when I read the study, I'd never heard of a vended water station. And so I'm reading this going, I had to look this up on the internet. Like, I live in Oregon. I've never seen one of these. Um, I, granted, I don't spend a lot of time in, in shopping malls or what have you or mini marts, but I'd never seen a, a vended water station. And you literally go take your bottle, your jug, and you fill it up. And basically, it's highly filtered. And so the question is, what's the fluoride level of those vended water stations? And this looked in Harris County, Texas. They looked at 34 zip codes. And what they found was that the fluoride levels now remember that fluoridated water in the United States is not one part per million. We've reduced it to 0.75 parts per million uh, nationally um, to reduce the amount of fluorosis. We still have this you know, same benefit that we had. Um, but this is down in the, around the 0 0.2 parts per million. So if a patient is worried about fluoride exposure, worried about you know, getting too much, they're using water to mix the formula, for the baby or whatever, and they want to reduce the fluoride level, this is a great opportunity and way to do that. But also know that you know if you're drinking this water as a routine, you're not getting the benefit of fluoride in the water. Of course, most of our bottled waters don't have fluoride in it either. Um, and then this next study looked at uh, 7,600 K through 12 students in North Carolina, and they evaluated what are the quality of life issues between dental caries and are there quality of life issues associated with fluorosis. And what they found was that the children experienced no quality of life issues uh, with fluorosis, but they had significant quality of life issues with, um, with dental caries, and that, that kind of would be to be expected. This study was done, and, and it looked at on a 10,000 tooth level, it was a model study where they were modeling what are the costs of, you know, we traditionally don't, as a routine, seal all primary molars. What if we did? What would be the cost analysis to, to you know, our entire system? And is that a benefit to do that? And in terms of the cost and benefit uh, risk ratio, and they looked at a 10,000 teeth level. And what they found was that by routinely sealing all primary teeth, that we had large opportunity losses. And an opportunity loss is defined as when I spend dollars on a treatment that turns out that it wasn't necessary, those are dollars that I could have spent on some other treatment that was necessary from somebody that would have benefited from it. So you know, there's the opportunity loss for us. Um, so that doing this across the board on all primary teeth maybe isn't necessary. What we really need is to figure out who's going to benefit from the treatment and who's not, and that's Canberra. I mean, that's Kerry's risk assessment right there. That's, they're asking for that. However, when we look at particularly just look at the Medicaid enrolled children, okay, so the low socioeconomic group, the majority of whom are more, tend more to be high risk for dental caries, what they found is that in terms of sealing all of their teeth, it reduced the cost to the restorations um, they were avoided down to $8 versus $65 for restoration avoided by not sealing their teeth. So I think certainly, again, and this is a 10,000 tooth level of modeling, um, you know, trying to figure out a cost and benefit ratio. Um, so what I, the takeaway from these two studies is we should be sealing more uh, primary molars, but it should be specifically on children who are high caries risk. And the way that we get to that is through the caries risk assessment. <clears throat> This was a study I included. They looked at um, white spot lesion development around resins and then tensile bond strength around resins, resin modified glass ionomers and glass ionomers. And what they found is what you would expect. The group that had the highest white spot lesion incidence was around resins, uh, but, they, but those had cohesive failures you know, in terms of bond strength. Uh, the glass ionomers and the resin, mod resin modified glass ionomers were more uh, more protective in terms of white spot lesion activity, but then they tended to have adhesive failures. So that's kind of you know what we see, and it kind of reinforces you know our experience with using these different materials in the mouth. This is a study that did it was a uh, systematic review. They included 12 longitudinal studies that were in length from five years to 22 years, and they looked at um, 
survival of all composite restorations. And what they found was that, at, you know, across the board, about 80% of composite restorations survived. Um, they found that the, the risk for them to break down was the more surfaces and the larger the restoration was, the more likely that it would fail. And the higher the caries risk in the patient, uh, the, the more likely that it would fail. And so those are both, you know, things that we would expect as a result out of that. But, you know, we have data that shows there was 80% composite survival. This is a study that um, we tend to look at um, uh, the gaps in our restorations, you know, and micro leakage, and you know whether it's a crown or whether it's a composite restoration. This was a study where they took the gaps and they looked at 50 microns, 100, 200, 400, and they bonded restorations, and then they with that gap, and then they went back to look for lesions on the interior wall of the restoration, and then they also, as a control provided a restoration that had zero gap but, but wasn't bonded. And what they found in the conclusion was bacteria don't care how small the gap is. A gap is a gap. The, the lesions were just as severe in the 50 microns as they were in the 400 microns. So you're not a better dentist at 50 microns than the guy that's doing you know platform switching with the restoration at 400 microns. Um, the reality is no gap is the answer. So any gap is big enough for bacteria to get into. It doesn't matter how small it is. So for us doing this, we really need to think about, you know, making sure that our restorations are sealed as well as possible with no gaps. Uh, this is a, a paper I reported earlier in the year, uh, in January, when we did our last review. And it was a really a, a, a well-written paper uh, in most regards. My only conflict with the paper was that it was looked at probiotics in dentistry and all the things that we use it for and, and across the board in healthcare. The only problem I have with it is it didn't report any negative results. All the studies included showed a positive result. And I would have to tell you, weighing the evidence, I find more negative results than I do with positive results and when it comes to dental caries, <laughs> specifically as a, as a treatment strategy. And so here's one of the studies. Of course, this was um, an in vitro study, 240 bovine teeth. They expose them two times a day or six times a day um, to uh, lactobacillus rhamnosus. And what they found was that lactobacillus rhamnosus did not have any inhibitory effect on the mutant streptococci, but rather it actually contributed to is to the caries process in vitro. I mean, you know, they adapt and just join the party. And lactobacillus is a strongly acid uric bacteria. And it just doesn't make sense to, to me to try and re, you know displace a one carigenic bacteria with potentially another one in the mouth. They have to get into that whole pathogen concept, and we really need to think to start to think biofilms rather than pathogens. Um, this is a study I reported. This was published last year, and we don't have a lot of data that shows that. Uh, toothbrushing and flossing actually proves, it improves outcomes in dental caries treatment. There are a few, but there's not an abundance of, of this. And this was a study that was done in Scotland. It had 99,000 children in it. It was over a period of 20 years. And what they found was they could actually reduce the DMFT scores in these kids from three down to two by just teaching them how to brush their teeth in preschool. And so, uh, you know, here's a great study that says, yes, the sooner that we teach these kids how to brush their teeth, the better. Now. Interesting, this study came out of um, India. And what they found was that if we're going to motivate these children to make sustainable lifestyle behavioral changes, like learning how to brush your teeth <clears throat> and having a healthy lifestyle and good home care, it takes daily motivation. It's not a one and done. And if you've got kids, you know, you don't tell them one time, go brush your teeth. Oh, you know, th thank you so much. Give them a positive stroke and reward. And then you don't ever have to remind them again. You have to motivate them every day. And that's, that's true for adults as well. It takes motivation over a period of about nine months to create a sustainable behavioral change. And that's a daily interaction. So uh, I think that's important for us to be aware of. This was a study, a systematic review, looking at World Health Organization guidelines on the amount of sugar in the diet. And at 10% sugar intake in, in terms of total calories in the diet, you know, there was a little reduction in dental caries. But at five, below 5% 5 sugar in the diet, there was a significant reduction in the dental caries relationship. However, it was judged that the, the value or the weight of the evidence was very low quality. But certainly we know dental, you know, dental caries and sugar, that, that, that is an issue. It's not the only issue, I think, as you probably concluded tonight. And the last paper I want to present tonight is just a study that came out of Brazil. And it's really about fear. And, you know, I, I treat children, and I know that you all do as well. And, you know, we see the fearful child, and sometimes it's the first time that they have seen us. But what this study did, they looked at and evaluated dental fear as it related to 
dental caries and previous dental pain, and then whether or not, um, you know, they also looked at socioeconomic status, and then whether or not the child had ever been to a dentist. And what they found was that a patient who has dental caries and has dental pain, uh, regardless of their socioeconomic status, uh, is fearful before they've ever even seen a dentist. So whether they've seen a dentist or not, dental fear is caused by the pain and suffering from the disease, and that's what you and I are here for. This is this is the difference we, we want to make in the world. So um, with that, we are done tonight. Did my headphones just die? I'm getting a beeping. I could just use that instead here. And so that is the um, the final study that I want to present tonight. We have finished right on time. Um, and I would share with you we've got some exciting webinars coming up. Um, future guests I'm going to have on the program are going to be Dr. Doug Young from UOP, and I also am hoping to get Graham Milicic from New Zealand uh, in the next couple of months. So I really appreciate um, all of you spending time with me tonight, listening to this webinar. Uh, I, I really value your time and I don't take that lightly and so I, I deeply appreciate your concern for your patients and your commitment to treating this disease. We are making a difference and so uh, that's the good, you know, if I have good news tonight, uh, we collectively are making a difference and we really are the gatekeepers. If not us, I don't know who's going to do this. So um, I applaud you for your dedication as a professional. And so Janelle, we have time for a few questions. Yeah, great. Thank you, Dr. Cooch. Uh, we have some really great ones coming in, as always. Um, so let's go ahead and start with, um, you mentioned there are 17 species of bacteria associated with periodontal disease. What role, if any, does the ATP score tell us about a patient's perio risk? You know, that is a really, really good question, Janelle. And it's not one that I've studied in depth. Um, Periodontal disease is more of a, uh, let me back up for a second, dental caries is really a pH disease. Dental, um, periodontal disease is more of a, a redox reaction um, below the surface of the gingiva. And so are the ATP levels, because of the inflammatory response, are they elevated or is the bacterial load elevated in periodontal disease, kind of like what we see with dental caries. And I would tell you, I, I, I haven't studied it enough to have a, an answer. That's a very good question, and you're thinking along the, the great, a great line of, of thought. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I will tell you that I did study it um, early on, and I couldn't, and the ATP level subgingival are high just across the board, whether you were healthy or whether you had periodontologies, and I couldn't really find a breaking point in the data to say, ah, this correlates at this score with period high risk for periodontal disease and this correlates, you know, this correlates with health. Um, it's something that we'll probably continue to, to study in the future, but uh, at the present I don't have an answer, but it's a great question and, it's, and I, they're certainly thinking along the right line. Great. Um, next question is, do you see a future for in-office genetic testing as part of Carrie's risk assessment? Yes, I do. <laughs> That's the short answer. Um, I would love to have it today because, you know, currently, you know, we go through those kind of uh, the usual suspects, and if I can't find a suspect, I mean, my suspect becomes by default kind of there's a genetic issue going on here, and I can't really confirm that unless there's a geographic pattern of those lesions in the mouth that we have described or can identify. So I think that you're going to see probably, it depends on how quickly it develops in medicine, in terms of genomic testing on patients, but um, could we have a genetic test for some of these strong um, gene markers for this disease? Or you know, I think so. Um, will it be in five years or ten years, or are we talking about twenty years? I don't know the answer to that question, but I would tell you, without a doubt in my mind, the day is coming when we as clinicians will sit down with a patient, take a swab of their cheek, and and may have a real time, well, in real time, I mean, you know, several hour test that's done chair side that we can get a result on. But I, I anticipate seeing that in the, in the near future because that, that field of genetics is continuing to grow and accelerate. And I think we're going to, it's continuing to, I think, clean, paint a clearer picture of our understanding of this disease. And certainly genetics plays a role. Great. That, that's an exciting thought. Uh, we have one more question here. 
I am a dental hygiene instructor and would love to use some of this research in my lectures. Is it possible to get a list of the studies you referenced? You know, that's a great question, and I get that question quite frequently as well. Um, let me better that one yet um, and say that if there's any instructor, you know, listening to this um, webinar or anybody else who would like to present it to their study club or to their office team, you are welcome to a copy of my PowerPoint presentation. And not a PDF file, but actually the PowerPoint itself. I give away my PowerPoint slides to anybody that asks for them. Um, I just ask you just credit me that you got them from me, and then use them to, to spread the message, teach other people. You know, I, the, we've got an entire profession here to educate. And so if there's anything I can, if there's previous, uh, if you would like to have previous copies of PowerPoints, uh, all you have to do, they're, they're here for your asking, and, and I certainly enjoy being able to support and help you with that. So um, the answer is a bold yes. Great. Thank you, Dr. Kujan. And do you have anything else to add before we wrap up, wrap up for this evening? I, I, I don't think so. I mean, we cover a lot of materials, and I cover a lot of ground. I thought there were a lot of interesting studies that were developed just in, in, printed and published just in this last year. and. Um, I just want to thank everybody for their dedication and their passion for this disease and being a part of you know this movement. So um, I will see you all again on our next webinar. Thank you so much great. for being here. Thank you. And it, again, thank you to everyone uh, for all your great questions. Any questions that weren't answered by Dr. Cooch will be answered via email within the next few days. Um, and an email will be sent out tomorrow with a link to the recording for anyone who wants to share this webinar with their staff. And if you want to learn more about implementing Canberra into your practice, we do offer one-on-one -on -one webinars and would be happy to schedule one for your team. And that's all we have. So have a good night. Thank you again. Thank you.